You'll never learn until you intentionally learn. They get said, I'm going to learn something today. By the time you're done, ask each other, what'd you learn? And you should be able to answer that moment, that question, after this service that you learned something. And if you learned something, you grew. You don't grow just by being here. You grow when you learn. Come on. Is there any learners in this house? Let's give Christian, he's our campus pastor at this campus. Let's give a waiver of Lowry's. Come on. He has a preach for a while. Let's get ready to receive what God has for us. Can we give our senior pastor, Pastor Marco, a round of applause, church? Come on, can we give the best pastor in the world a better applause than that? He does a lot for this house. Thank you, Pastor. Now can we give God some praise? Uh, can we give Jesus some praise in here? I mean, he deserves all the glory, doesn't he? Come on, let's do a little better than that. Jesus deserves our praise. I'm so honored to be up here and bring in the word tonight. You know, I, don't, I really don't treat these moments lightly. And every time I approach the pulpit, my prayer at home and my prayer with my wife is always this. God, I can't do this without you. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to be up there without you speaking. Because this isn't about any one man's opinion. This is about a word from God that could change your life forever. And in this moment, I believe that God's going to speak. And he's going to speak to us very clearly and all we have to do, as Pastor Marco said, just receive a word from God. And I believe our lives can change forever. How many believe our lives can change with just one word from God? Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. And we're ready to receive a word from you, God. God, we're hungry. We're desperate. Some of us have come into this room with pain and bondage. Some, Father, have come in here because we were invited. Maybe we felt like, some maybe feel like they were dragged in here. But God, I know, Lord, that your word is for everybody in this room. And you have a word for each of us. And I pray, God, tonight you would speak to us clearly, Lord. We want to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, move in this place. In Jesus' name we pray and we say, amen. 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 You may be seated. Give your neighbor a high five. And say, it's good to see you tonight. I remember, I remember when I was younger, um, I used to go to church on and off growing up, different churches I would go to. But when I was younger, I used to think church was like putting in hours spiritually. I used to, I used to think that the more church you went to, like the better you were with God. Like we were cool. Like I could have a bad week, but... As long as I go to church, I clocked in some hours and I was good. I used to even think this as a kid. I used to think the longer the church service was, the more holy everything was. Like I put in more time. I did overtime for God because the church service went over. I even used to think this. This is crazy. I used to think that the more boring, the more boring the service was, the bigger the sacrifice it was for me to go. So I was like, God, I gave this to you. I used to think these things as a kid. And I don't know what your thoughts are about going to church. For some, I know that this is a, a big thought. Church is, is just a bunch, a bunch of hypocrites, full of hypocrites. I used to think that. Anyone used to think that like me? I used to think it. I used to think things like church is so religious. It's just a bunch of rules. I used to think like church was boring. I used to think what's the point? But there came a moment there came a day, I, I still remember the day. I remember the day I came to my first service at The Way. Now, I'm not trying to boast about The Way World Outreach, but The Way is my favorite church of all time, obviously. But there was a day I remember I came to church, and I was a teenager. And that day I came to church, something shifted and changed in my approach and my mentality about what church was all about. I stopped being so self-minded and I started fixing my eyes on what God was actually trying to tell me. This entire time, God had a message for me. He had a plan for my life. He had a purpose for me. I didn't know, but I, I realized soon that God had freedom for me. Freedom from addiction. 
freedom from pain, freedom from rejection and depression. And all of these ideas I used to have about what church was soon started to go right out the window because I realized that God was going to meet me at a church service and he totally did. My life was radically changed forever and I was never the same again. I still remember. It was a service that someone was preaching. They made an altar call. I came up to the altar call. No one asked me to come up at the end of a service and we're going to give you an opportunity to do the same thing. I came up to the altar call and I just remember standing there by myself, lifting my hands to God and telling God, whatever you want to do with me, God, go for it. Use me however you want. And in that moment, I, I'll never forget this. I, began, I encountered the presence of God in a church service. I began to cry uncontrollably, gator tears. I'm talking gator, like <gasps> mocos coming down and everything. It was a moment I'll never forget, and it marked me forever. And from that moment on, I made a commitment that I'm going to church for the rest of my life, and I'm never turning back. I'm making it a priority of my life. I'm going to be in church. I don't care if it's a Wednesday night, a Thursday night, a Sunday morning. I'm going to be at church. Friday night, I'm going to be at church. Why? Because I know God has a plan for me, has a purpose for me, and it happened in a church service. God gave me a word, and my life was changed forever. And I thank God I come to a church that is full of God's power, full of his word. Why am I talking so much about church? Well, because today I'm introducing you to a scripture, to a church from the Bible called the, the church in Thessalonica. Someone say Thessalonica. I know it's a crazy name, but that was the city at the time. And Paul was writing this letter to this church in Thessalonica. And he wrote this letter and it sounded way different from all the other letters he was writing to all the other churches in the area. This church, and I just want to give you a little background. This church was a great church. This church was an on-fire church. This was a loving church. This was a hard-working church. And of all the other churches that Paul was writing to, this church, man, made Paul so happy. And it, put, it pleased God so much. Because the other letters he was writing to other churches, these churches were full of division. They were full of perversion. There's a lot of crazy things happening. But this church was different. And today we're going to look at scripture and we're going to answer, we're going to see what the Bible says about what makes a great church. What makes a great church? Today we're going to look at five things. I'm going to say five things that make a great church church. And I thank God I'm a part of a church that is a great church. I'm part of a church that has changed my life forever. And I believe that you're a part of a church, you're in a church that's going to change your life forever. Let's start. You guys ready to jump in? I'm done ranting. Let's open the Bible already. First Thessalonians chapter one. I'm going to start from verse two. It says this. Oh, actually verse one. It says, this letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica, to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. Now verse two. It says, we always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. Now verse three. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing we wanna identify First thing that makes up a good church is this. Someone say, faithful work. Say that again. Say, faithful work. What does faithful work mean? Well, the Bible says it here. And to find in scripture, it says, faithful work is anything that's accomplished because of your belief in God. Any work that's accomplished because of your belief in God. Now, there's a lot of work that's being done, I'm sure. A lot of things that we're doing. Uh, maybe you're working, on, uh, you're working on your job. You're working on your career. Maybe you're working on something in sports. For me, you may know, um, I like golf. So there'll be times I'll go on my day off, I'll go to the driving range, and I'll work on my golf game. And let me tell you, it's not really helping at all. And there's times I'm out there, I'm, I'm frustrated, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out why my golf swing isn't working, and 
how come the ball is going left when I'm aiming right? And if you, you golfed any time in your life, you know what I'm talking about. And I realized something. All of this work I'm putting in for golf, it means nothing at the end of the day because here's the truth. There's such thing as a faith work and there's such thing as work that has nothing to do with the, you know, the kingdom, with eternity. And what God is showing me sometimes in these moments, there's things, there's work and there's effort and there's sometimes you put in work even in the street life. Sometimes you're putting work in your, in your, in sports or in other things. But I realized this, it doesn't matter, it doesn't always categorize as faithful work because it has nothing to do with our faith in God. People put in all kinds of work, but unless it's for eternity, it's not considered faithful work. And what was good about this church is that they were putting in work for the sake of other people. They were kingdom minded. They were thinking about others. They were building people up. And you want to know what that looks like? That looks like hitting the streets on a Saturday at a dot the block. You know what that looks like at this church? That looks like making some sacrifices for the city of Pomona, for someone we haven't even met yet, but we're putting in work to make sure this church is built and lives are going to be transformed and someone's going to get saved up in that building and they're going to be changed forever. That's what the work looks like. For some people, it looks like work, like coming in early and making sure this campus looks great for everybody in here. Sometimes the work is maybe telling somebody about Jesus and inviting them to church on your way here. For sometimes the work is those that are vacuuming the streets or, or vacuuming the streets, uh, vacuuming the carpet. I mean, if you're vacuuming the streets, that's serious work right there. A lot of work being put in here. There's people right now that are on our cameras. There's people right now that are in the back right now controlling all the screens. There's people right now that are outside in our parking lot attending to the cars. There's people right now that are taking care of the kids right now, our little loved ones. There's people right now that are taking care of our teenagers, our high school and our junior high. There's work being put in right here at this church to make sure that we're going to be connected to a loving God who has a plan for your life. Now, I'm not saying that working at your job is, is, is not good. I'm not saying that you can't have fun and work on your sports and work on your golf game and like I'm trying to do, but it's obviously not really working. But I'm not saying those things are relevant. But what I am saying is this. Make sure that there's a faithful work happening in your life. That at some point in your life, you're making an effort to put the kingdom first, to build God's house, to make a place for other people to come and know God the way you're hearing a word from God tonight. There's others out there that are depending on you getting to work. You know, there's someone in this world that needs you to roll up your sleeves and say, I'm going to put in the work for somebody else. You know that, you know what's crazy is a lot of us wouldn't be here unless those before us were willing to put in some work. You know, this church started with months and months and months and months of just work without even a church building being opened yet. People were on the streets, knocking on doors, meeting needs and loving people. Work. Someone say work. I know it sounds like, you know, this is like a like a, a career seminar here, but the truth is this, we got to get to work. If we're going to see those around us saved and, and, and connected to the gospel, how many know that that's true? The Bible says in James 2, 14, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions, can that kind of faith save anyone? You know, the, another version says faith without works is that just means this, I can put all kinds of work in. I can do all kinds of things in this world. I was actually thinking about this today as I was, I was praying in my house and I was just walking around and I was thinking, I said, all these things I do, all the material possessions I have, everything I have, I'm, I'm not going with any of that. When I die, none of that's coming with me. But the only thing that I'll see in heaven is the stuff, the work I put in here for the kingdom of God. Whatever I did for eternity, I'll see that in heaven. Whatever work I put in here on earth for the sake of the gospel, I'll see that in heaven one day. My clothes, gone. My houses, gone. My cars, gone. My companies, gone. Everything I have, gone. But what I do for God is going to go with me for eternity, and it's going to be in heaven. What we need, what makes a good church are those that are putting in some faithful work. Someone say faithful work. Faith without works is dead. 
For some of us, it's time to resurrect our faith, believing that God can do something through you. Believe that he wants to use you and get to work. You know, sometimes that's the first hurdle we have to get through, is even believing that God wants to do something with you. God wants to use you. You know, one of the, the lies of the enemy that I think comes up a lot is, I've done too much bad. I've lived such a horrible life. God would want nothing to do with me. What do I have to offer? For some, maybe your idea is this. I'm, I have nothing to offer. I don't, I'm not, I, I can't speak on a microphone. I, I'm not like those singers up here that can, you know, sing the house down. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, there's, there's a lot of things I can't do. But you know, that the only reason why you're saved and you're still here, the only reason why you're still here is because God has a work for you to do. God has a purpose for your life. And I'll, I'll even say this, that it doesn't matter how far you've gone, you're not out of God's reach to do something in your life. Your sin, your past, your mistakes do not disqualify you from being able to be used by God in a mighty way. I don't care where you come from or what you look like, how many tattoos you have on your face. God can use you in a big way, and he's done it before, and he could do it again. Trust me, God has a plan for your life. Look at someone next to you and say, God can use you. He has a purpose for you. God's still working, and he has a plan for your life. It's no mistake that you're here today. It's no mistake that, God, that you're hearing this word. But, but the, one of the biggest hurdles we got to get over is that God won't want to use me anymore. And look, maybe this is you. Maybe you threw in the towel and you gave up on the vision that God once gave you. Maybe you've seen yourself. Maybe you heard from God, a promise from God. Maybe God spoke to you one day about, about using you in a mighty way. And maybe one day your fire was lit like a burning inferno. And now it's feeling a little dry. I want to encourage you tonight. You are also not out of God's reach. You also are not out of God's mind. You are on God's mind. And God has a purpose and a plan for you. And my word for you tonight, God's word for you tonight, is get up, dust yourself off, and get back in the game because God has a plan for your life. And he's ready to use you to do something to change someone's life. How many believe God can use you? So that's one thing that makes up a great church. It's a group of people that are willing to do some faithful work, to do some work that builds people, some eternal-minded work, some, some work that helps people come to know God. Another thing, a second thing that makes up a great church, according to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2, it says, look at verse 3. Put it up there, please, verse 3. It says, as we pray to our God, Father, we think of your faithful work and your loving deeds. Someone say loving deeds. That's number two. What is a loving deed? A loving deed is intense labor motivated by goodwill and kindness towards another. I'll read that again. A loving deed is intense labor motivated by goodwill and kindness towards another. Now, the Thessalonian church at this time was motivated to love others, even to the point of exhaustion, and even to the point of, of just intense labor. You know what this reminds me of? I said it before, I'll say it again. Adopt a block. This reminds me of Adopt a Block and all of our outreach teams we have here at the church. Shout out if you're part of the outreach team. Thank you for all you do. Our outreach teams, they're hitting the streets every day seems like every day. I remember, I remember one time being in adopt a block and we were reaching a, an apartment complex. And um, for some reason, it seems like every time we schedule an event, it was the hottest days of the year. It was literally an inferno in the sky. It was so hot. And I remember it was so hot this day that you could see your shoe prints in the street. 
There was, we were literally melting, it was melting the street. That's how hot it was. You could see your footprint in the street. But we were out there. The team was out there loving and ministering and caring for people. We're talking intense labor motivated by love for somebody. We were there not because we're getting anything out of it, but because we love them. We're there not because we're going to gain something, but because we want to give something. We're there because we want to care for somebody. Right now in our streets are people that are dying. Right now in our streets are people that are strung out. There's homeless. There's prostitutes giving away their body for just to meet, make ends meet. But we're there because we love them, even the least of them. Even those that have nothing to offer and nothing to give, we're going to love them and we're going to care for them and we're going to be there for them, even if it requires us being in the blazing sun I remember that very day 82 people gave their lives to Jesus on that hot summer day with the with the floor boiling hot and you know melting the ground but they were giving their lives to Jesus praise God someone give God praise for that adopt the block they're still doing that every single week our outreach teams are out there still outreaching and ministering. We have teams right now that hit the streets late nights on Friday nights and on baseline. We have a team of young adults that go out there on Friday nights on baseline. There's a couple cops that, that found out about it. So the cops come and join the young adult team and they're just there outreaching with the team now. How cool is that? We have teams hitting all over, all over the city, all over. We have senior outreach teams. We have uh, teams hitting Muscoy, Spanish outreach teams. We have, we have teams all over the place loving people, bagging groceries, and giving them to those that are in need. I want to read this scripture to you in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong, a gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrifice my body, I could, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. How important is love? Look at how important love is. We can do all these things but not have love, it's nothing. It amounts to nothing. Our work should not be motivated. Our deeds should not be motivated by a what's in it for me. A consumer mentality. And how sad is it that we've been trained, and even, even just in American culture, we've been trained to be consumers. Ah, I don't like this show, switch. I don't like this movie, switch. I don't like what this does for me, switch. Next, next, next. But how many of us are willing to actually love somebody and put in labor, la intensive labor to care for somebody that's in need? Right now, there's people that are hurting and broken, and it's going to take someone stepping in and saying, I'll be there for you. I will love you. I will care for you. I will give you a bag of groceries. I will put in time to knock on your door and make sure you're cared for. I'll be there. Someone say loving deeds. Let's look at number three. The third thing that made a great church in this, uh, the Thessalonian church is enduring hope. Someone say enduring hope. If you go back to verse three, it says, as we pray to our God, the father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Enduring hope means this. Someone whose expectation of good is not swerved by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Someone whose expectation of good, someone whose hope is still alive, and it's not swerved by even the greatest trials and sufferings. You know, I'm not sure what, what pain, what level of pain, or what trial you're facing right now. I'm not sure what kind of storm you're going through or what kind of fight you're in. And this fight may be so hard that it feels like you want to give up. It feels like you want to quit. But I believe that with God's power and with his word, we can endure and not be swayed and not give up for anything. And not give up in any storm. And not quit in any trial. 
and not give up in any battle. I believe that I believe that we're part of a church. I believe that God is calling us to get through every single fight and he can do it through us and he will get us through it in Jesus name. He's going to get us through this fight. You know that a trial is not intended when we're going through a trial, we're not it's not meant to break you. It's meant to get you through it. The trial is meant to build you. The trial is meant to form you and shape you. You know, the Bible says that we count it all joy when we go through various trials. Why would I count a trial as joyful? Why would I be happy about that? I've never met anyone that's just like, man, I'm going through a hard time. This is great. I love this. But a trial is not meant to break us. The trial is meant to shape us and get us to the next level. And one quality of a great church, and one quality of a great place of God, is a place, is a group of people that can go through a storm and are saying, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to be ashamed to go through this trial. I'm going to get through this because I know God has a plan for me. And he's going to get me through this trial. How many people in here are saying, I'm going to get through this fight? I'm not sure what fight you're in, but we're saying I'm going to get through this fight together. Look at Ephesians 6.13. It says, so put on, put on all of God's armor. Evil days will come, but you will be able to stand up to anything. And after you have done everything you can, you will still be standing. No matter what comes our way, we can stand on the promises of God. Nothing will be able to take you down. And after you've done everything you can to stand, you're going to keep on standing. I don't care what storm hits, what hurricane, what torrent, what news you get, what report the doctor tells you. It's not going to sway me and my faith in God. It's not going to kick me out of the church. It's not going to keep me from standing. I'm going to keep on standing and I'm going to keep on fighting because I'm standing on a promise of God. And if I can stand on his promise, I know I'll be able to get through to the end. I got my eyes fixed on the prize. So I need to have that level of expectation that it doesn't matter what comes your way. You know the prize is yours and it's won. You know that the fight is fixed. If you knew this, if I guaranteed you that you would make it to the end of the 12th round and you would win, would you keep on standing? If I gave you a guarantee that no matter how hard you got hit, as long as you kept standing, that you would go home with the championship belt and that you would win on behalf of your family and your marriage and your home. If I told you that it doesn't matter if no one else in your family was worshiping God, if you kept standing in faith, that your family will be saved and they will be here in church with you. If I told you that day would come and I give you a guarantee based on the word, would you keep standing? What God is saying tonight is I'm giving you a promise that if you keep on standing, I will get you the victory. It's already won and it's already yours. Just keep standing. Endure to the end. We need that. We need that enduring hope back. We need that fight back. We, we, need, we need to get to the point where we don't throw in the towel the moment we feel a little gust of wind. It's like I feel a little gust of wind. Oh, it pushed me over. Look at this verse. Philippians 3.13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. Man, this is good. This is good news for someone in here that thinks you have to be perfect in order to keep moving forward. You know that, um, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be honest with you, okay? It may shock somebody in here. Um, you know, I'm not perfect and I'm still preaching. I'm not. And I'm, I'm gonna just tell, I'm gonna tell on Pastor Marco. I'm telling him. Some of you guys may have thought otherwise, but I'm gonna just tell the truth. You know, Pastor Marco's not perfect but he's still pastor one of the greatest churches in the world. All right, I'm going to tell him someone else. I'm going to tell him the guy who wrote part of this Bible here, Paul. You know, Paul wasn't perfect, but he still wrote the majority of the New Testament. 
There was only one that was perfect and only one needed to be perfect. His name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus purchased perfection and he said, you know what? I'm going to take this perfection and I'm going to put it on you. I'm going to take my righteousness and I'm going to put it on you. I'm going to take my glory. My, I'm going to take uh, my power. I'm going to take my strength and I'm going to give it to you. I know you're not perfect. I know you don't got it all together, but don't worry. I'm Jesus and I am perfect and I live in you. And if I live in you no one can come against you so he says dear brothers and sisters I have not achieved it Paul is literally saying I'm not perfect I haven't got there yet but I focus on this one thing someone say focus tell your neighbor focus I focus on this one thing forgetting the past forgetting the past Let's pause there. Forgetting the past may be easier for some than others, especially when your past has moments that that have hurt you and have caused pain to you. Now, I know it's not like a flick of the switch. Someone can't just tell you, hey, try forgetting the past. See if that works. It doesn't work that way. But this is why Paul says, I'm focusing on this here. I'm putting my effort and my attention on this. Forgetting, meaning letting it go. And in other words, letting the power of my past come off of me. Not meditating on my past day and night. Not fixating on the way the past has hurt me. Not fixating on how I've, I've let myself down and let others down in my past. I'm not going to stay stuck in my past and let my past dictate who I'm going to be in my future. Uh, so I'm going to do this one thing. I'm going to focus on forgetting. I'm focusing on forgetting the past. And the Bible says, looking forward to what lies ahead. You know, another Another area of our past we sometimes have to focus on forgetting. This is for all the achievers out there, all the leaders. Sometimes you got to focus on forgetting even the big moments you've had. Why will I say that? And I don't mean not being grateful. I don't mean being, uh, having a sense of gratitude for what God has done in your life. But we need to get to the point Will we stop being so stuck on our former glories and the former days and the good old days that we forget that God has more for you and that God has greater in store for you and that the glory um, the, uh, the glory in the later is going to be greater than the past. God has greater in store for you. And all he needs is a church that's willing to endure some trials, fight through some pain, get through a tough battle to see that moment come to pass. How many believe that the best is yet to come because God promises that? We got to forget the past and look forward to what lies ahead. Or even the next thing, number four, and I think we're going to get through this. I don't know. We'll see. Four or five. We're talking about what are the five things that make up this great church. Number four is they receive God's word. They receive God's word. Look at, let's go down to verse six. It says, so you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Whoa. Whoa. So they received the message with joy, even though it brought them severe suffering. You know, there's some kind of, uh, there's a level of suffering that comes, and sometimes it's just receiving a hard word. Sometimes the word hurts. Sometimes it's, why does it hurt? Because there's a moment where we have to come clean with God and say, God, I'm willing to let go of this because you call me to. God, I'm willing to obey. I want to do your will, not what I want to do. Uh, God, I'm tired of doing what I want to do. I want to start doing what you want me to do. Look at, well, look at what the word says. It says, in this way, you imitated both, uh, both us and the Lord. Verse 6, it says that. What does the word receive mean? Receive means to accept and not to reject. Simple. To accept and not to reject. Here's the truth. Anytime 
you hear a word from God, you can either accept it or reject it. Now, if I told you, if I told anyone in here, if I told you, if I said, I have $1 million for you. I hear people right now, they said, yes. People are like, yep. Some people said, someone said, woo. I said, if I said, I have a million dollars for you, do you want it? I, I, there's a million yeses in here, I'm sure. I'm sure you wouldn't say, let me think about it. Let me get back to you on that. I'm not ready for a million dollars right now. Is there anybody that's not ready for that? <laughs> I've never heard, I don't think I'll ever hear anyone saying that. I don't know anyone that would deny it or reject it. You would gladly receive it. There's no one, I can't, I can't think of anyone that would say, let's put a pause on it. Let, let's come back to that. Let's circle around. You would either receive it or reject it. But today, I have a word from God for you. And this word, you can either receive it or reject it. You can, but you can't stay in the middle. There's no such thing as, I'll get back to you on that. There's no such thing as, let me think about it. I'm not ready. It's either we accept it gladly or we reject the word of God. What are we accepting? We're accepting this truth that Jesus loves you, that he died for your sins. And unless we put our faith in Jesus, we won't have eternal life. But because Jesus has given us the opportunity to get saved today, you can receive eternal life. You can be saved. You can get filled with your purpose. You can be set free from addiction. You can have a brand new beginning and a new start. This is what Jesus is offering you. Will you accept it? But we can't be in the middle. There is no, I'll come back to that. It's either yes or no. And tonight God is saying, will you accept my word? Will you accept my love? Will you accept my power? Will you accept my freedom? Will you accept the life that I have for you? I have a new beginning for you, son and daughter. I got a new way for you. A new purpose for you. I got something for you. Will you accept it? God has given his promises tonight. Look at verse 13. It says, going down, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians, I'm jumping ahead to chapter 2, verse 13. It says, therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. This word what? Continues to work. See, the word only works for those who believe it. The word only works for those who believe it and receive it. The power is in the word. But if we refuse the word or we reject the word, we don't see the power of the word working in our lives. And the word is telling us tonight, I got a new start for you. I got a new beginning for you. And if we say to God, I don't believe it, then we will never see a new beginning. God says, I have freedom for you. I've come to set the captive free. And if we say, I don't believe that, then we'll never, be, we'll never see freedom. God says, I have a plan and a purpose for you. I have a purpose for you, a plan of good and a future and a hope. And God says, I have this for you. But if we say, God, I don't believe I got a future, then I won't see God's plan for my life. But tonight God is saying is I have a word for you. I have a plan. I have a purpose for you. I have a word for you. But it only works for those who believe it and receive it. Tonight God is knocking on your heart's door. And he's saying I have a word. Will you receive? Will you let me in? When we receive the word of God, really we're receiving Jesus. That's why the power is in the word. God is speaking today. Now go to my last point here. The fifth quality, the fifth thing that makes a great church is spreading the news. Someone say, spread the news. Go back to chapter 1, verse 8. It says, and now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere. I love that. Even beyond Macedonia and Achaia, 
For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. A good church is telling others about Jesus. Not only that, but a good church doesn't keep God a secret. A good church doesn't hide Jesus in a box when they leave church. A good church is letting others see how God has changed your life. A good church, a, a, a church, a, a good quality church is saying, you know what? I know, I don't know if they'll, they'll, uh, I'm saying this. I may look like a fool, but I don't care. It may be different around my friends. It may be different around the group I'm a part of. It may seem different in my workplace, but it doesn't matter. I'm not going to keep God a secret. And you want to know the best way to tell somebody about God? It's just tell them what he's done in your life. Tell them what he's done for you. Tell them how he's helped you. Tell God that, he, that, God, that God showed you he has a plan for your life. Tell somebody that God has set you free from addiction and depression. Tell somebody that God has set you free from suicidal thoughts. You used to once think about killing yourself and you just realize, I don't think about that anymore. Good news, a good church spreads the news. Spreads the news to everybody everywhere and letting everybody know that God is still moving today. I believe that this is a place where we can see that good news spread everywhere, and we are. We're seeing it in Pomona. We're seeing it downtown San Bernardino. We're seeing it in LA. We're seeing it in Mexico. We're seeing it in Arizona and Kenya and now Uganda. We're seeing it all over the world. This good news is spreading. But how does it spread? It spreads to people like me and you. It just lets somebody know about how good God is. And I'll tell you how good God is. God is so good that even though we were still sinners, Christ came to die for us. Even though we were messed up, Jesus gave his life for us. Jesus hung on a cross and Jesus was raised from the dead so that we can be saved and set free. You know, all the sin we've committed and all the, 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 the sin that we've done, there's a price on our heads because of the sin we've committed. And the price is eternal separation from God. And, and when, we, when we sin, the moment we sin, we have to pay this price. We owe a big debt. But because God loves you so much, this is the good news. He sent Christ Jesus to die for you to pay for your sin and debt so that everyone who believes in him and repents of their sin, they will not perish, but have eternal life. Tonight, this news is for you. This good news is for you. Tonight, God wants you to know he has a plan for your life. And tonight, you can be saved. And tonight, you can know that if you were to die, you would not, you would not be separated from God forever, but you would have eternal life with God forever. Not because of the good things you do, but because Jesus loves you that much and he gave, he gave his life for you. Jesus has a plan for you tonight. Will you receive Jesus? Will you receive this good news about what God has done for you? Everyone, let's just, let's stand to our feet right now without anybody else moving. I wanna ask you this question one more time. If you want to be forgiven of your sin and you want to be set free, you want a brand new life, you want to come to know Jesus, you want that purpose that we were talking about tonight, you have, you just, you desire that relationship with God, you want to be forgiven of your sin and you want eternal life. If you're saying, you know what, I don't know where I would go if I were to die tonight. I don't know where I would spend eternity, but I want to know this for sure. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Then when I count to three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. You're saying, that's me. I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to be forgiven of my sins, and I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to turn around for the way I've been living, and I'm ready to give my life to God tonight. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room. One, two, three. Three, raise your hands, raise your hands. I see your hand, I see your hand. Two, three, four, five, six. Anybody else? You say seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Anybody else? You're saying that's me. 
15, 16, 17, 18. Anybody else? You're saying that's me. 19. Anybody else? You're saying 20. Anybody else? 21. I see you. 22. I see you down there. Come on. 23. I see you. Let's give God praise. 24. I see you. I'm proud of you. 25, 26. Let's do this. For all those that are ready, ready to give your life to Jesus, and you just raise your hand tonight. We have a whole team up here that's going to welcome you, congratulate you. We're going to give you resources to help you grow. And if you raise your hand, I want you to do one more bold thing. As we get excited and as we clap, can you make your way out of your seat and come forward? Give us the honor of praying for you and congratulating you. Come on, make your way down. If you raise your hand tonight, come forward, come forward, come forward. All those that raise their hand. And if someone was next to you and they raised their hand, just ask them. If you, wanna, if you want me to go up there with you, I'm willing to go up there with you. Ask somebody next to you. You're saying, if you need me to go up there with you, I'm willing to go up there with you. Come on, let's give them a hand as they make their way forward. Come on, this is awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. They're still coming, church. They're still clap. They're still coming. We clap for every soul. Thank you, Jesus. This is what it's all about. Lives being transformed and changed. Amen. God has a plan for you guys. God has a purpose. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give God praise. Let's give God praise. Come on, church. It's still coming. Is it okay that we wait another 10, 20, 30 seconds for one more soul to come to know Jesus and to be saved and set free? Is that fine? Thank you, church. Come on, let's give a hand. They're still coming up. It's a brand new start and a brand new beginning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Let's do this. Everyone who just came up, just look at me for a quick second. God has a plan for your life. And he's going to do something. He's going to use you guys in a mighty way. And there's nothing from your past that can change or dictate what God can do in your future. There's nothing that's happened before to you or because of you that will disqualify you. What God is saying right now is I'm going to give you a brand new start and a new beginning. And I'm going to begin to use you in a new way, but not because of how good you are, but because of how good he is. And God is going to, he's going to shape you. He's going to mold you. Remember, this is just the beginning. This isn't the end. This is the beginning. This is the end of your old life, yes, but the beginning, the beginning of your new life. What we're going to do as a church, we're committing to walking this out with you. We're going to help you. We're going to help you grow. We're going to coach you. We have classes here at our church. They're going to help you grow in your walk. The person in front of you, what they're going to do is they're going to open their app and they're going to click, click, click a tab that's called I Got Saved. Everyone listen to me real quick. They're going to click a tab that says I Got Saved. They're going to help you get signed up for your next step. What I want you to do is commit to just taking your next step. Say this with me. Say, I commit to taking my next step. We're going to help you take that next step. Okay, and the person up here, we're going to pray with you. We're going to help you with that. We're going to help you get baptized. We're going to help you get discipled. We're going to help you read your word. We're going to help you learn how to fight. We're going to help you follow God and live for God, and your life will never be the same again. Are we ready, church? Let's give one more hand clap for all the souls, the new souls that are coming to know God. New beginning. Let's pray. Bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Say, Jesus, thank you for saving me and for setting me free. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and for, and for raising from the dead so that I can be saved and set free. Jesus, I put my faith in you. My life belongs to you. I'll never be the same. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Make me a brand new creation. I'm following you from this point forward. And I will join the church, become a body, uh, become part of the body. Use me, Lord. Fill me with purpose. Give me a vision for life. And I will live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Amen and amen. Church, one more round of applause for those that got saved. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, church. If you need prayer, come forward. Don't forget, this Sunday, we have service here. Let's spread the news. Let's invite somebody. We're going to hear a great word this Sunday. Don't forget. Don't miss out. Also, Friday, we got our men's and our women's service. Don't miss our Friday men's and women's service. Also, Pastor Marco, he's going to reveal if we hit the goal where we're at on our Pomona campus goal this Sunday. So don't miss it. If you need prayer, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to uh, just talk to you if you need it. God bless you. Have a wonderful night.